Welcome back to Strata Live here at theCUBE, SiliconAngle.tv's flagship telecast where we go out to the events and talk to the smartest people we can find, interesting people, smart people, and we extract the signal from the noise and share that with you. Um, SiliconAngle.com has all the coverage, SiliconAngle.tv has all the videos on demand. This is live and we're going to talk with data scientists here. I'm John Furrier, with founder of SiliconAngle.com and I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org and we're here with Jesper Anderson, who's the founder, general manager of Bloom Studios, also as John said, a data scientist. Jesper, this is one of those deals where a picture's worth a thousand words. I mean, you just go, it, it, for people in the audience, Google uh, Bloom Studios, and check out the website. It's it, it's gorgeous. I mean, it really Very is. Um, and you know, we just I'm used to. Every, we all are. You know. I hope they don't have the cube effect because you know the cube effect is when we give a website out, it just crashes. Crash. So uh, you know. Yeah, but I mean, you know, and when we when we prep for these calls, that. we go to websites, we learn about products and things like that. I went to your website and went, wow, I've never really seen anything like this. And I know Mark is going to bring up uh, some some examples. But want, before we do that, why don't you tell us a little bit about? Uh, uh, Bloom Studios, wh where you got the idea for you know, founding the company and what you guys are trying to do. Yeah, so, so Bloom Studio is uh, essentially charged with making consumer applications out of uh, data and data visualization. So we're trying to make toys of your data that later on become tools. And the idea is that sort of visualizations uh, mimic, the interactions with data visualizations mimic the way you interact with video games. And so that we thought we could take those mechanics and layer them on top of each other and make something that was really pleasurable to use so that you could peruse your data in a, in a more engaging way. And so, uh, one of our iPad apps makes a galaxy, galaxy metaphor for your music, and so instead of just looking at a list view of artists or whatever, you navigate down through solar systems and planets and moons to get to the actual tracks you want to play, and just kind of go through an experience that's much more reminiscent of like a Mass Effect game or something like that. So, is the primary motivation for using your tools um, just fun, it feels good, it's cathartic, or is it you know, uh, are you finding other, I mean, what's driving so the, I think. The first motivation is definitely pleasure. It is to make something different that's more engaging. Uh, but then visualizations support uh, serendipitous discovery in ways that more direct search or, or list views don't. Because it's such a, you have to have declared your intention before you go to look for something. And visualizations tend to, to bring forth relations that didn't exist before that um, uh, you you wouldn't be aware of and you can discover later. So by having these beautiful visualizations, you're finding that people are discovering new information and new ways to but interact I, with their data. Absolutely, I mean, that, that's why the field was invented in the first place. So We're just video, that more front and center. So we love rich media, we do the live broadcast, we capture on demand, we love capturing content, um, we do some photos, but media is sticky, photos in particular. What are you guys finding in terms of the elements of communications? Uh, is, is the user experience want kind of combinations? What are you seeing that, that resonates best from a visualization standpoint these days? Because we all know Facebook has a popular app called The Photo, and people are posting zillions of photos on Facebook. What media is resonating the most out there from your standpoint? I, 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 photos are definitely key for us. I think that, that it's a really, it's a, there's a lot of metadata, so there's uh, around photo applications, so there's a lot you can do to kind of expose new relationships between the data elements, and it is highly visual, so it's really interesting. Uh, one of the things that we're, really interested in looking at next is, is video and seeing what we can do there. Where it's a little more complicated because there's less yeah. metadata for the amount of content available. But at the same time, we, we think that it, it's a huge problem that there is this sort of conundrum between the armchair experience and the TV experience that we want to try to bridge and we think that data visualization could make finding new snippets to watch faster and easier. Uh, and a more pleasurable experience. Obviously, Pinterest in Palo Alto, where I live, is a um, hot company, and you know you got all these new kind of techniques. I guess my a question I have for you is more of a philosophical one, mm -hmm. based on your experience and maybe vision around the future user experience. The web obviously evolves from static web pages to the user experience has always been a cool area to push the envelope on. Now with cloud, mobile, social, you have analytics, you got data science, and you have a user experience now that's have different elements to it, mobile. You know, you have TV, has been connected, Netflix soon to be brought, uh, bundled in with Comcast. All kinds of new things happening. What's your vision around the user experience and their expectations of the users? I think what we're trying to, the way we think about it and what we're trying to get is, is maybe going more to a, the original sort of Unix-like metaphors for the, the web uh, and trying to think of more sharp tools and how can we combine them so that you, you start to think of the tablet as the, moving more to HTTP, HTTP and not HTML, and the tablet becomes just the way you view 
or tablet applications from the way you view the web content, and then you can chain those things together in more interesting ways and get back to a sort of a, a tool set instead of a one mon monopolistic experience. Can you get an example? Out of. Um, no, because we're inventing those right now. <laughs> when you say um, Unix toolkit experience, what do you mean by that? Uh, you mean so from, a development ex from a developer or from a user? From a user's standpoint, that you might you know, use one application to find a set of tweets, for example, and those tweets, you might want to select just the music ones, and then take those music tweets and pipe them to a music application to play them in one experience, or to a video application, conversely, or something like that, or make sharing a little more direct, so don't share within the application, but take the data you want to share into another application and then share it from there. So there's a couple of um, tools that, Mark, I think you, you have these, you can bring them up. So one is a cart Cartogram, um, and it's essentially a, a way to show public photos. Um, you can type in a, a a place, yeah, right, and it'll show you. So I can I can type in uh, Santa Clara, California. Yeah, we should take you to what what was interesting in Santa Clara recently. And, and it'll it'll show me <laughs> no, nothing. Uh, what's happening Oops. in Santa Clara. Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot going on in Santa Clara. Maybe well, Santa Clarans find interesting about Santa Clara. <laughs> more Great America is right next door. <laughs> you maybe, know? Uh, maybe I type in Italy or something like that, the, and then it shows me a visualization of. Yeah. All this cool data. Now, where's the data come from? So this is all from Instagram. And so we're using their public APIs to, to, to get as much information as we can for all the different geo points. And then we are behind the scenes uh, doing some, uh, some graph calculations to figure out what are the most important photos from there. So not just using their, their popularity metric, but coming up with one of our own that's more about significance. Okay. And, and can, I mean, without, without divulging the dark secrets of your, your yeah. algorithm, I mean, w w w essentially, what does it do for me as a user? So it, you can really think of it very, very pragmatically. It's, it's page rank for photos. Yeah. Uh, and basically it just takes the users who contribute the most in terms of voting and takes their votes and makes them more important. And then, and then Fizz um, is a way to visualize uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter data. It looks like you got LinkedIn on there as well, right? Yeah. So if we click on the Twitter, I'm going to do something wrong. So I think he and got that. It's going to take a little second, but yeah, it'll okay, come through. So it's just a, I've got a slower connection than we probably do. Uh, yeah. Online. You just design in there. And then so while Dave's doing that, I, I want to kind of ask you around, because we think about, the, first of all, we love what you do, you guys are doing, fantastic, but big <laughs> supporters of it. <laughs> Thank you. you know, we're challenged here at SiliconANGLE and Wikibon because our goal is to provide as much content as possible um, in, in a social format and, and, and make it open source. We don't charge for any of our content, but you know, we have a website, but we're not trying to build it as a destination. We also have video, we also have photos. Um, we're constantly challenged around the design problems and challenges around getting away from the locked-in Walt Garden website model to right. something more promiscuous and frictionless, where the user experience can be better than yeah. some of the other content sites out there. What should we be thinking about? Because this is not just our problem, this is everybody, right? I mean, everyone who's in the media business has to eventually get to the folks who are natively, what I call the Apple natives and the, you know, the mobile natives, like my son is 16. He doesn't, right. he doesn't read the New York Times, never will. Um, he'll never really watch TV much other than gaming shows or anything he's interested in, maybe. So there's a whole new set of generation of users coming in that need to access content. What should be people thinking about? What should we be thinking about? Well, I mean, I think, again, it, it's, it's going back to applications that there's a richer experience there on the apps on the on the iPad or uh, on your desktop, and that the website itself is becoming a little too too brittle and a little not um, flexible enough to do what you want to do. And, and so once you're within the app context, then you actually reown the experience, even though it's a micro experience, and you can start to do things there to, to you know both reward yourself and your your users and, and kind of. Um, create a more controlled but flexible experience, as long as you give your users sort of a way out, which is sort of yeah, yeah. the make angle it free. that we want. Out. Well, make it free or, or make free it Free to leave, add, not locked and, in. You know, certainly make, make the content shareable and findable on the web. Use the website as the way to, to share and, like what Path does, actually. They do a really good job of the, the Path application is this lockdown experience, but all the elements are on a web page somewhere that you can share. So I, I have uh, this other application, FizzUp. I don't know, uh, Keen, if you, if you were able to log in. Yeah. So, so basically, um, we've got these, it's basically a representation of uh, Twitter data from 107 people, for me anyway, with 200 updates from about 50 minutes ago uh, to about 26 seconds ago, so near real yeah, time. Yeah, near real time. And so I've got these sort of blobs, and there's a huge blob in the middle, so it says at Furrier, what's that all about? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, dominating my Twitter stream. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, all right, so what are we looking at here? So this is essentially that every large circle is a user, and every small circle within that is a tweet that that user has sent. And so 
this is a way of kind of breaking free of the timeline view that sort of predominates all of the Twitter River. clients. Yeah. yeah, and so you can kind of get back to like, you know, maybe you, you took a break from, God forbid, from Twitter for, for a day or something like that, and you can come back and get a cross section of what happened, what was important, and who was talking about what. And so you can type the keyword in the search field, maybe and you can see like, what was a strata activity you know, today or something like that. Yeah, so, so if I do that, if I type in strata, uh, it's, it's going to narrow the search down to, to those tweets that are relevant exactly. to strata? Exactly, just those right? tweets, so, and then you can kind of see, and, but also the users that provided those tweets. So you can get a sense for who was loud today about that, who had an opinion around that sort of topic today. So the size of these bubbles didn't really change, but the, act, the data inside the bubbles changed. And so yeah, absolutely. That implies that you know Stevie Chambers was maybe more active than Techie Junkie, and John Furrier was very at Furrier was very active, et cetera. Exactly. So, so uh, what so kind of so I'll get back to my questions. I'm maybe I'm a, obviously personal agenda with making our site better. Um, is there technology that that we and others can use? Like, do you, are you guys selling the software? What do you guys? I mean, we need to figure out a better CMS, and we, we're always constantly looking at what can we be programming in. I mean, also we have a big data backend that we use. I mean, we've been really, really successful with Hadoop and HBase. Some of the things we're doing on the data sciences side for SiliconANGLE, Wikibon. Right. Um, but our web presence, it's I want to make it better. Is there better? We use WordPress, right? WordPress is obviously mm -hmm. open source and cool, but I want. A better see I need better software. What can we? What is out there? So, you know, for the CMS thing, we rolled our own too. We didn't really like what was out there. Um, but on the front end, like you're seeing sort of a, a novel, like there's a growth of these novel frameworks to take advantage of what HTML5 can do and what WebGL can do, uh, and those frameworks are starting to come into maturity in a way that actually is accessible to to people. And so Mike Bostock does some really great work first with uh, Protoviz now. Who did? Mike Bostock. Yeah. Uh, I think he had a presentation earlier earlier this week. Um, but uh, so he does this great uh, sort of dynamic web page uh, um, uh, library called D3, uh, and you can see it's something else called 3GS. That's a Mike Bostock. Bostock, yeah. Bostock. He's at Square right now, I believe. Um, and then there's another library called 3JS that sits on top of WebGL and makes that accessible to, to mere humans and takes care of all the boilerplate and things like that. And I think those frameworks are going to start to be the ones that become the lingua franca of the kind of next level of, of really interesting website. And certainly the ones we're leveraging when we build websites now. One of the things we think about is obviously iTunes and Apple, right? And tablet, it's huge, and Android. What's going on there? I mean, how are you, what's the market like over there from a tech perspective, from an integration as you people move content into there? Is it just straight HTML5 that you got to worry about for Apple? or? What are some of the things uh, we, that you're we, finding? We code almost exclusively in C++ for Apple um, in order to keep it marginally uh, portable. Though they're, they're, we're still not completely compatible with Android, unfortunately. Uh, as for HTML5, it's for our perspective, because we do a lot of dynamic three-dimensional stuff, we're somewhat hamstrung because they don't, haven't opened up WebGL on the, the WebKit browser that you can use natively. Um, which is only, you can get that for iAds only. And so we're, we're waiting for that before we really leverage um, HTML5. However, you know, we do really enjoy the ability to, to create a WebKit and that's how we show Twitter content or, or deep content whenever we can. Yeah, what about the back end, obviously? What kind of uh, big data infrastructure and software are you using Hadoop, HBase? Um, we're actually exclusively on, on Mongo and Mongo using DB. streaming analytics. So we we're, we try to be scale free. Which analytics? Well. Streaming analytics. So we, we calculate all the analytics on the fly and try to make, make uh, be scale free that way. Cool. Anything else? We're just uh, it. Node, Node, MongoDB. Node JS. Node JS. Yeah. Yeah. We did the Node Summit. I love that community, man. I think uh, Node is probably one of the hottest things happening right now. It, it's definitely where all the hipsters are at right yeah. now. <laughs> You're good good work's coming out of there. I mean, no, I mean it's not just hipsters. It's uh, dudes yeah. pumping out some good code. Oh, absolutely. IO is great. Your background, Jesper, as a data scientist is interesting. I'm just noticing you've solved some problems in you know, financial services, credit card fraud, uh, home valuations, and, and the likes. So what led you to this sort of visualization? I, well, I started getting more interested uh, in uh, consumer-facing data science. And what we could do, it sort of, uh, doing the home valuations was definitely geared towards you know, how we present users with <coughs> the home valuations uh, and things like that. And uh, confronting sort of that uh, as data scientists, culturally, we've been so accustomed to working exclusively on a B2B level and providing you know, actionable business metrics to users, and that all of my training wasn't actually very well geared towards providing consumers with the equivalent sort of services. And so Bloom was sort of a, a good chance to kind of stretch those muscles and, and wrap my head around and wrap our heads around what it would do to how you would present data science to users in a, in a more straightforward way. And it turned out to be quite different answers, we think. 
Outstanding. Okay, so thanks for coming on the Cube. We really appreciate it, Jasper. You guys are great. Love your love your company. Love what you're doing. It's probably the cutting edge work that I've seen. Uh, it's needed. This is a future user experience. HTML5, all new stuff. Node.js. Uh, this is stuff that's music to our ears. We wish there was more code out there that we could work with. So. Uh, We'll see you around. You guys in San Francisco? Yeah. San Francisco, obviously doing great stuff. Um, design is critical, but also the back end is having that support as well. So we'll be right back with our next guest. I want to thank the